In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Although we are in year B of the three-year cycle of gospel readings, and we emphasize the gospel of Mark, the end of Mark's gospel is unusual, to say the least. A few of the ancient manuscripts in the final chapter with verse 8. Another adds a shorter ending to that. And still other authorities skip the shorter ending and add a longer ending. And so during the, the great 50 days, uh, we use lessons from Luke and John because they reveal much more about what happened after the resurrection than does Mark. The story of the disciples as they locked themselves in a house for fear of the Jews gives us hope and vision for the future. The closest followers of Jesus had no direction as they sequestered themselves from the Jewish authorities. In times past, followers of prophets who claimed to be the Messiah left Jerusalem in a hurry to escape the authorities who had just crucified their leader. They too could have been arrested for insurrection and received the same fate. So on the evening of the resurrection, Sunday evening, the disciples huddled behind locked doors trying to figure out what to do. And Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Locked doors were no barrier for him. I think it's interesting that the disciples didn't seem to be certain of his identity until he showed them his hands and his side. Then they rejoiced, and Jesus, Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace be with you. Now, is this what you would have expected Jesus to say the first time he saw the disciples after the crucifixion? Do you think it might have been something else, more like, well, why didn't you listen to me? Or I told you what was going to happen three times. Or why were you so surprised? No, none of that for Jesus. It was simply, peace be with you. Several years ago, when ISIS was overrunning Iraq, I saw a television program of several monks in an ancient monastery some four miles from the city of Mosul, which has a population of 1.5 million. Recently, ISIS and Sunni extremists had taken over the city. And of course, the monks were horrified of the strong possibility of being overrun by ISIS losing their lives and having their ancient monastery and its historical archives destroyed. I was very upset with the broadcast because it made me realize that I don't know for sure if I would have the courage to die for being a Christian. I even confessed to this, this to my spiritual advisor and he said, don't worry. You will be given the strength to meet such a challenge should it ever occur. We never know how we will face tragedy until it does occur. And then God will give us the strength to persevere. In his collection of essays, A Grief Observed, C.S. Lewis wrote, you never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life or death for you. It's easy to say that you think a rope is strong and sound as long as you just wrap it around a box. But suppose you had to hang by that rope over a cliff. Then you'd really discover just how much you trusted that rope. Because Jesus was resurrected from the dead, all of us who believe in his name can have hope. Hope to live with him in this life and hope for his guidance 
and providence in the life to come. As soon as Jesus said, peace be with you, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This scripture is the reason that the ministry of priests includes granting God's absolution for the forgiveness of sins. In the service of ordination to the priesthood, the Holy Spirit gives the priest the ability to absolve, to bless, and to consecrate. Sometimes these gifts are referred to as the ABCs. In telling the disciples that they have the power to forgive sins, Jesus gave the disciples the ministry of reconciliation. Sins can be forgiven. People can be made right with God. And now, Jesus is our advocate. That's what the epistle reading from the first letter of John says. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. It's like having Jesus as our lawyer to plead our case. And once our sins are forgiven, we are free to help others also to be reconciled to God and each other. That's what today's collect is asking. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their truth, by their faith. In other words, grant, Lord, that we may be the person that we say we are. Once I asked my spiritual advisor, what would happen if my congregation discovered that I wasn't as smart or as talented or as knowledgeable as I should be as their priest? He said, David, they already know. <laughs> Oh, he said, it only takes a few weeks for a congregation to know what their priest's strengths and weaknesses are. It doesn't take very long for people to determine whether what a priest says matches the way they live their life. And it's the same for all Christians. People already know whether what you do is congruent with what you say. The colleagues ask God that through our rebirth in the risen Lord, our lives may match what we say we believe. Of course, we're all sinners. And had Jesus not paid the price for our sins on the cross, we would be doomed. We can't be good enough to earn eternal life. This truth is revealed in the phrase priests sometimes used to bid the offertory. It's from the first letter of Peter, beginning with the third verse. Thanks be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for by his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus gives us a new birth full of hope, to live our lives to his glory. Dave Campbell, past director of Camp All Saints, often said that passing the peace was a very important part of worship because in that act, we get to live out our theology, to be who we say we are. Regardless of how we might feel about someone, we can share the peace of Christ with them Jesus knew that God's peace brings joy and reduces fear. And it will be a wonderful day when we can get back to a little bit closer, passing the peace of Christ with each other. As our reading from John instructs us, there's a close tie between Jesus and the Spirit, and also between the Christian community and the power of the resurrected one. Because the risen Christ is with us, 
we need not fear the future. We don't have to manage our future by ourselves because, you see, remember, we're not alone. We have an advocate. Easter releases the Holy Spirit into the church, and the spirit that gives us faith is ours to give to the world. In fact, according to the Catechism in the back of the prayer book, this exactly is the mission of the church, to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. The church is right in the middle of people who are sometimes afraid, often lonesome, and may seem to be estranged from God and each other. The message of Easter is not only a future hope of everlasting life, Easter assures us that there is a certain joy in the present life, regardless of our situation. Jesus gives us his spirit so that through us, God's glory can become present in the world. May God's grace enable us to fulfill this mission of reconciliation so that all people may enjoy the abundant life promised to Jesus right now and be happy living with him in the life that has no end. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.